Oh, hello there. Welcome back to the Agostino Zynga Show with me, your host, Agostino Zynga. And this is episode number 236, right? Dos, tres, yes. Dos, tres, yes. Seis. Seis? Yes, I think it's seis. Dos, tres, yes. Dos, tres, seis. Dos, tres, seis. Okay, tranquilo. Dos, tres, seis. Bien. How are you guys doing? How are you guys feeling? How's my Spanish going? Pretty well, isn't it, right? Sober October Spanish time. We're in it. Even though I haven't done an hour, as I promise I'll do. I keep fucking slacking. I haven't done my journey. Those are two things I haven't done, actually. But you know, before that, how are you doing? You all right? Good. Hope you're feeling well. Hope you're feeling good. Early morning. Go get started. Um, Get rambling with the topics before I head off to work. But yeah, the Sober October stuff, right? It's been strange because the only two things I've kind of failed on is, ta- is doing a journal. Um, which requires me to spend 10 minutes um, at the end of the day, usually, I think, to kind of round up and kind of, you know, figure out what happened and kind of, you know, dump all that shit on paper. Um, it's certainly journaling what occurred, things that you liked and during the day, things you didn't like, things that you're thinking about, things that you're mulling over. And it's pretty joy down. Basically, going back to how I was before when I was in school, I used to have a diary. Um, it, it happened, you know, when I had a diary in school, kind of, this is, this is a bit of a, yeah, a bit of a bad time. It was I had a diary when I was younger, living back at home, because I was going through so much shit with my parents. Like we had loads of fights, there was loads of kind of turmoil in the household. I was growing up into a young man. My parents were adjusting to having these kids in the flipping, you know, Western society with different sort of ideas on how they should go about their life, and they weren't necessarily abiding by the rules that my parents were kind of adjusted, were kind of raised up on, very conservative very religious or very christian based um kind of way of growing up and you know i, I have sympathy for my parents because it must have been such a tough time having three boys going through puberty uh, becoming their own men um you obviously trying to enforce your own rules and kind of um order in your own household it must be such a weird time to be a parent i don't envy that whatsoever but i remember for me personally that was a way that i kind of dealt with it by kind of keeping a diary i'd keep a diary about all the things that i kind of went through and i remember before i moved out um yeah, before I moved out, um, I remember reading it and I just chucked it away because it was too painful. It kind of brought back so many bad memories. Um, it was really visceral. It was really real. It was really raw. It essentially was. Now I understand why books like Stillness is the Key and the other book I have up there, um, Daily Rituals, kind of speaks a lot about. There's a lot of um, successful people. Stillness is the Key, uh, Ryan Holiday's book, he mentions it a lot that there's a lot of successful people out there who kind of swear by journaling. And I get it because it does. I get in the terms of a positive way, frame of thinking in a positive way of kind of going about it if you're a high-flying executive or a business owner or entrepreneur and you have the ability to kind of dump all these kind of loose thoughts in your head onto a bit of paper and then kind of close the book and then kind of start anew the next day it kind of allows your mind to be free to kind of do all the other tasks you want to do and also it's quite good for just cognitive ability just stress and just psychological alert, um what do you call it psychological comfort psychological satisfaction whatever it may be you just feel better right the fact that you got it out of your head so i can see why that would be good but imagine for a kid growing Growing up and going through such a tough time and then when you're growing up in your household and you're just having fights with your parents you just don't know what makes sense and everything is all confusing and you don't really fit in with your friends outside of school and you're just confused you're just just confused imagine reading that back again to yourself now in this kind of in your adult age where you've kind of grown up and you've known a couple of things you're like oh it just feels so painful you feel ashamed about some of the opinions you had about your parents about what you thought about yourself it's just disgusting man so i didn't really feel i didn't really like it so i chucked it away but now looking back on it, i kind of regret throwing it away i think those um chapters in your life are really important i think the idea of kind of because i used to do that quite often right especially with ex-girlfriends i used to kind of always do this thing where i'd kind of purposely delete or erase everyone from my brain that i didn't want to think about anymore it wasn't any it wasn't hate or anything i just whenever a relationship ended even friendships, I do this mental thing where I just kind of pretend like you don't exist. Um, so, you know, and again, that's how I dealt with things. Maybe it's a man thing, you know, but Bill Burr talks about that, right? The idea that you just kind of, as men, we just bottle these things up, right? That's why probably men die of like strokes and, you know, heart attacks and stuff so early on, so young in age, in early 50s and shit, people are dying of strokes and having heart attacks or aneurysms or whatever because we bottle in so much of our emotions. We don't really let it out. We don't talk um, freely with our friends about how we feel, Right, even if you know how I said that, how I enunciated how we feel, right? It makes it sound as if like it's some sort of like you know effeminate thing to be in touch with your feelings. But the fact that we do that so often, it probably leads to more problems and more issues. And maybe the only really way to deal with it as a man, especially if you're not at all down with sharing your feelings, is to probably get a journal and write it down. So I probably should do that going forward, and I probably am going to do that. It's another thing I've got to add to my list that I haven't done for sober October. Um, I got to do it one. I've got to do a stand up set. I want to do a class of mixed martial arts because I'm scared of doing it. And I also want to do 
um, my learning of Spanish one hour a day because it's really important and I need to get that language down pat for the most part. But yeah, those are the two things I'm kind of a little bit, or three things I'm a little bit like, you know, um, on the rocks with. But you know, slowly but surely, I think hopefully I'll get there. Anyway, as I mentioned, let's get into the topics and get right into it because, you know, there's not much time to waste, not much time to waste around here. Loads of topics to get through. Most of this stuff is going to be streetwear based news. So if you're not that way inclined, then I apologize for the um, streetwear specific nature of this podcast. But hey, you know, I am the number one streetwear podcast in the world as I proved in my descriptions. And obviously, I'm wearing a very streetwear specific outfit today. Look, I've got the shades on. Yeah, I've got the little varsity jacket. I've got the vintage Pink Floyd t-shirt. Can you see that here? right vintage pink floyd t can you see that can you see the name of it no 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 there you go yeah vintage pink floyd <clears throat> right so i'm i'm fairly i'm fairly streetwear looking today um maybe not streetwear maybe just more fashion looking streetwear is not really of this sort of ilk but who knows who cares let's move on some topics and get right into it so topic number one babbity 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 ba is should we streetwear should go into the five ways of saving you again let's see let's go into the so um no let's, let's before we go to streetwear let's get into this topic i, I thought was quite interesting supposedly so meetup.com have you used meetup.com before have you used it i have right um being a serial loner and being a serial solo traveler and being to all the places i've been to like berlin barcelona uh madrid nicaragua bali all these kind of places i've been to on my own um specifically sometimes when i go to these places it's quite cool because you can sometimes you know through just being around and being social you can find places to go to and hang out have a good time but usually it's quite cool to kind of break the ice with these sort of meetup groups that you can go to, whether it's a language exchange, whether it's a football thing, um, whether it's a sports watching thing, whether it's a bar, bar or pub pub bar or pub crawl. There's always occasions where you can go and meet people up on these sites, meetup.com, people set up events, hosts organize them. You click your attending and usually you kind of go and attend them. And I never knew how it works with the host uh, mechanics. I'm not sure if the host has to pay a fee to kind of host their event on meetup.com because usually when you go especially for a bar or pub crawl, Usually, I think the host has a deal in place with the bar so that the more people come in and spend money, usually they give you subsidized. I remember in Barcelona, you got subsidized beers in a particular bar. Every bar we went to, yeah, Barcelona one was a good example. Barcelona, I did a meetup to call at Barcelona Language Exchange where I did the Barcelona Half Marathon a couple of years ago. And uh, maybe, no, three or four years ago. Three, three, four years ago. I did a Barcelona Half Marathon. One of my fastest times I did, I probably did like one minute, one hour 47. I was really happy with that time. Um, I went to a language exchange meetup where essentially we're in the pub crawl and each pub we went to we'll switch languages so one pub will speak only Spanish so if you're Spanish if you're like me English speaker learning Spanish you'd get a chance to practice Spanish next one will go to speak switch to English so Spanish speakers can learn English from us and back and forth right we went to about three or four pubs overall and each place we went to we got subsidized drinks or we got like a set menu that was kind of discounted right and that was pretty cool so I think usually the host will work out a deal with the place and kind of get some money maybe uh on the back end of that i'm not too sure how that works out but again it's for punters or for customers like me or people that want to join it's excellent to go to right but there's been a development lately that supposedly they're going to start pay pay um charging host a fee or charging attendees i'm not too sure what the actual thing about it is but here's this um tweet here from a woman called hannah rosenberg um let me see who, who is hannah rosenberg do, 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 just loading it but it is it's Hannah Rosenberg. Hannah Rosenberg is an organizer, founder, and developer at Veles Communicus, blockchain woman, blah, blah, blah. So she's obviously involved in the community. So she put this post up now on her Twitter that says the following. I'll go up on your screen. I'll read it out to you for the podcast. This says, says meetup.com, payment change is coming soon. Meetup is always looking for ways to improve the experience of for everyone in our community. One of the options we are currently exploring is whether we reduce cost of organizers and introduce a small fee for members. So being beginning in October, members of a select groups will be charged a small fee to reserve their spot at events. The event will fee can then be paid by members, organizers to cover the cost of the event to make it free for members, which is, you know, I don't really have a problem with. I, I looked at it, I was like, oh, that, doesn't, that sounds okay for me because I'm assuming there's a quite a big um, a percentage of people that don't show up to meet up. So I know I haven't, right? I know I've just sometimes I've gone to a city, I've just clicked attending on all these things I want to go to and I haven't showed up because of, you know, I don't know, other plans have come about. I just have had, I have, I have, I have, I've had other ideas. So I can assume if you're a meetup um, host and organizer and you reserved a bar and you bought, I don't know, stuff to people to do arts and crafts and then you're expecting 50 people to come and only 30 come it's going to eat into your um profit margins or it's going to eat into your setup costs right in some regards so maybe having a charge set in place will be a better way to go about it i know airbnb 
do a similar thing with their experiences. They don't even bother doing the whole like free thing. It's all everything's paid. People go on there, have an experience like the one in Berlin where you can the person people show you, you know, spatties to go to, or they give you um a way for you to uh get into the Berghain, write courses, all that sort of stuff. Um those are just flat out fees. You just pay the money, you do the course and you keep it moving. So I, I don't know how they operate as a business or how or maybe this is the way they're gonna make money because I don't really know how they even make money for staff and stuff at like Meetup if they're not charging people for anything if it's free to host if it's free to attend then how are they making any money to even host a site to keep it running you know the servers and all that sort of stuff it must be a pain in the ass but i don't know so um that's what i thought initially but let's read the comments and see what people think about it andreas um on block on from the bitcoin fame said we should export all the members on csv before they lock the exits um blah blah, blah. but then i think i actually f searched on twitter and found some a, a recent thread that kind of explains some reasons why people are against it but i didn't really have a reason as to why people i didn't really figure out why people will be not down for it but let me see if i can find it here da, 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 where is it meetup.com yeah let's see what people said on the search because i didn't really see what the issue was personally i don't really see why i mean like if they charge people a fee not to to make sure that there's no no shows because again the, the transaction of money does a go, goes a long way i think i've said it before to a lot of friends like when i have friends that I, I want them to help me out for something if they're tattoo art not help me out but imagine you have a friend that's got a skill a trade whether they're a carpenter whether they're a removal service person they tattoo artist uh hairdresser a photographer whatever it is i like giving my friends money because i think the exchange of money um changes the dynamic of the occupation changes the dynamic of what you've agreed the deal it becomes in a transaction of business business they can give me make sure if they want but i'm willing to pay them the money because i want them to do the job i don't want them to feel as if they're obliged to give me a favor and then usually as well the people that don't want to give money to their friends to do them a favor are usually people that are most most demanding they're the ones that demand people their friends to come at a certain time they're belling their phone off they they want a quick turnaround and a thing that they, like it's just it's just a weird I think if you if you're expecting that level of service, you should give your friends some money so that on their end they also want to make sure that you're happy with their service and don't think that you're they don't think that you're, they're going to take the piss because you you guys are having a friendship. So I don't really, I, I so the money thing I don't really have a problem with like giving money to do something. I'm I'm perfectly fine with um as long as it's not an exorbitant amount. Of, again, we don't know how to judge whether or not something exorbitant or something's too expensive. But I think charging money does not a bad thing. Um. So here it goes, right? This is some um, contacts from people that was talking on Twitter. So some of the reactions are the following. My money is on meetup.com shuts down in less than one year. This thing makes no sense. Imagine paying meetup to keep your event free. What? Um, imagine communities will switch to FB in no time. Well, people say that, but if they would have switched to F Facebook, they would have done it already because Facebook is free. So there's a reason why meetup.com works better than Facebook. I don't know why, why it is, why it matters. Maybe because of the fact that on Facebook, people can see you attending things like that Facebook, that Facebook thing. I, I'm watching my privacy settings, but that Facebook thing where every event you click that you're interested in, it automatically shows on your feed is super annoying. People can track exactly where you're going, all your friends. It doesn't make any sense. Obviously, in some cases, if you have your, because I don't have my feed up, my feed is blocked on my Facebook, so I don't really see what people are posting. So I can just go in there, check my notifications, post an event, and keep it moving. I don't, I don't browse Facebook. I don't know what anyone's posting. So I guess if you are, have your feed open, Maybe it's quite cool to see what your friends are attending so you can go to or whatever. But it's just strange, isn't it? That all your friends can see everything you're going to attend, everything you're interested in. It's such a... I don't know. I've never got that. Hopefully, there's a setting to change it. If you guys know, if anyone knows about how to change the setting so people don't see what the, the events I'm interested in, please let me know in the comments. I know before, the other route to do it was to just save the, the setting, the event. Um, you could just go in the little arrow, I think, or the little dots on the side and save the event and it won't show up in your notifications. But that's not the same thing i mean i don't want to that's another action i have to learn to go in my save tab check the thing that i did it's like so i just want to know what my events are know that i, I, I could interesting and, and, I, and i'm wanting to go but i don't want all my friends to know where i'm going so i can track all my movements it's just annoying anyway another reservation behind me up charging says the following here me up payment change start in november sucks for the community a lot of alternatives will grow it appears me up pro members are not affected for some reason the next oh so there is a me there is a pro version of me of meetup.com which makes sense the next thing to cancel me up they can't be serious with their new payment system. I mean, there was an option to charge a fee to attendees, but a lot of organizers chose not to do so. Why on earth is this asshole move? Well, they need to make money, that, I guess, isn't it? That's probably the asshole move. I guess if you're running a company like meup.com and you have employees, you have to pay them or you need to be able to, you know, um, have some runway in order to kind of survive the next couple of months or maybe the investment hasn't come through. You need to make sense. Most of these changes aren't usually to piss off the customers, I've realized. Having worked in startups, having worked on the inside, as... um as idiotic as it may seem for us for people on the outside who aren't involved in a company 
it really is ju- usually down an economic version. It's usually an economic thing. Usually there, are, there, there might be on a rare occasion some founders who wake up and have a, on a whim decide to just change something of, of the of the company because they just you know they just they're just trying to be um they're trying to they're trying to live up to the caricature of what of what your entrepreneur CEO or founder is where they wake up one minute and they change the whole direction of the company the next minute it's another direction right that can happen but um, for the most part most of the decisions are usually driven by economic reasons right they need to make money they have to make they have to pay salary people are depending on them in some re- some regard this investment hasn't come through the round of investment didn't come through the investments maybe is pulled out wherever it may be the market is changing <laughs> It makes complete sense. I'm surprised so far Meetup has lasted so long to be honest with Facebook being around too. You'd think Facebook would have eaten into their profits or whatever it may be, but I guess for the most part, there are a lot of people who are, have a hard stance against having Facebook accounts. So a place like Meetup.com makes complete sense, isn't it, in that regard? Um, payment Meetup, da, 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 what else are saying? Lots of questions regarding the payment changes. Da, da, da. So what people are saying here, that's really bad. So you're starting to look at the alternative Meetup because of a new payment policy. Have a look at gettogether.com. So a lot of people are jumping in and trying to do their own thing. But again, I don't really see the issue of it personally. Maybe someone needs to educate me on it. Please don't force this payment model upon volunteer customers. We run our communities because we care and we have a resource. Okay, this guy's got a friend. Let me see this guy's friend, what he's talking about. I'm really really interested to see what the reservations are. So this guy called uh, Salve J. Nielsen says the following about Meetup charging now. Says, dear Meetup. I'm involved in a couple of volunteer-based meetup groups, mostly around open source software or similar volunteer-driven technical communities. I understand you're planning to charge our attendees just for signing up. This is a problem. I pre- I'm pretty sure this will create a negative um, consequences in, in and my similar communities. You see, within volunteer communities, we depend on goodwill within our group when recruiting new volunteers. By offering something useful to users, the members of our community, we give, we give them a reason to give something back. And the thing we want and need from them is their time. We want them to the volunteer too, so that we can come together and make a better community. When you charge them, even a small fee, you'll get the impression that a transaction has happened and that our relationship ends there. Why should I help organizers I pay to be here? Imagine trying to organize something about a topic you care, deep, you care deeply about. W- would you really want everyone in your community to think of you as a service provider instead of a community organizer? Please don't force this payment model upon volunteer communities. We run a community. Blah, blah, blah. Okay, well, I guess anyway, th- that's that's a pretty fair um, uh, opinion. And I guess judging by the post I've got on here, it does say that they're mulling, they're thinking about it. So they're looking at ways to improve the experience. So it's not a, pr- a, a, a thing that they've set in place now at the moment so something that's going to ro- roll out everywhere specific groups so maybe with this sort of feedback it could be because this is this is quite reasoned feedback for himself i really kind of see his point reasoning here again someone could probably make an alternative but part of the reason why meetup works and part of the reason why i signed up for it in all these different cities that i mentioned is because it's quite easy you sign up you click the thing that you want to attend football tournament knitting classes dj class whatever it may be right and then you go ahead and go and meet some new people gain some new friends get some new drinking buddies, just have a good time, right? Get some social um, interaction in your life because sometimes, you know, especially in adults, I've said before in the adults, it's hard to find friends, it's hard to find hobbies and interests that involve people that you can do just on your own. So a place like meetup.com is specifically tailored around solo, lone travelers or people that don't have a big social group or people that have specific niche in, in interest that not a lot of people have. You go there, meet some friends and then your, your community grows from there. So the idea of maybe transactioning is probably not what, meetup.com ethos stand behind but then i guess for the most part like i said i'm pretty sure it's just an economic reason i'm hope hopefully the founders come out and say something regarding it but i'm pretty sure it's just because they need to make sure they pay rent and make sure people are paid their salaries at the end of the month I'm, i assume so but who knows it could be something different but yeah interesting um developments but there if again if anyone knows more than me and i'm talking out my ass then please let me know in the comments i'll be interested to know um that was one bit and then another topic i have on here is about Emily. Should we talk about Emily Lens? There's a really interesting thread here on Techno Reddit about Emily Lens, which I'm really interested in to, to kind of um, talk about a bit, see some of the top comments people mentioned here, um, and see what people are talking about. So, this is a topic here coming up from the Techno subreddit. Again, I recommend people check it out. If you're obsessed with electronic music like I am, electronic underground, electronic culture, that sort of malarkey, please check out the Techno subreddit. It's the best place to get all your kind of techno related news on their uh, on the internet website at the moment so and it's a pretty good community people are a bit nice on there it's not as toxic as other, other subreddits i might be honest so there's not a lot of name calling there are some favorites on there there are some people that people despise you know everyone's got their biases but for the most part it's a pretty solid community so there's this thread on here there's a lot of talk about amelia lens about peggy goo about some of the girls black madonna you know some people who think you know there, there is a lot of um 
confusion as to why some of these people have become so successful over the last few years um so quickly i guess um there was a real there was a real yearning in the electronic music scene for djs that didn't look like the standard guys that we see all the time playing at all the festivals right there was a particular kind of person that was playing at the same parties all the time and i guess there was a bit of a confluence it seemed like there was a bit of a there was a bit of a, a big bang moment where there was, there was a group of really forward-thinking promoters making cool new festivals who are up to like getting new artists involved in their festivals and profiling and showcasing better or new not better new talent fresh new talent and with that also came the need for different voices right whether there were different people for different races and creed different genders different sexual orientations these people need to also be involved in the conversation to make it a bit more exciting and i think it all kind of uh, conversion in some people or some women that were around during the time who were very good at DJing anyway who happened to take advantage of it were able to kind of ride that wave pop and continue going on and kind of further their um their prospects and their um their career trajectory and their gigs and all that sort of like which i've got no problem with i think it's fine i think it's perfectly fine to lean into whatever um thing that separates you from the pack and to sort of use that to kind of catapult you and get to another platform because i think by and large i think even if you put a gun to your head of most of the fucking female dj haters out there they can't really say categorically that said dj is crap at what they do they might not like some of the music they play but you can't say as a dj that they're not good right these even peggy goo black madonna charlotte the way emily lens but Millie lens specifically is the one that probably is kind of gets most of slack and sometimes maybe peggy goo with her brand of collaborations and maybe the fact that she's blown up so quickly over the years and blah 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 blah, blah um is that as per usual in all areas of life the the the, the, the top five or one percent are the ones that get all the opportunities i think it happens in every industry right we see it happening it's the law i don't know what the law is but there's a, there's a common term behind it right the one percent or top five percent are the ones that get all the opportunity everyone else has to fight for the scraps and even if you do kind of become a little bit more egalitarian you do you know it's a bit more balanced in terms of gender you're still gonna have the same um problems that happen with the male dominated scene happening again nowadays with this kind of scene we're having now we're seeing it now right because i'm sure there's some girls out there that despise those girls that i mentioned because they think they're not talented they think they're just all about the social media they think it's all an image thing i'm pretty sure that that's happening conversations around you know bars and clubs around the world some girls who think they're super talented or think they've been working harder than these girls and these other people have been given opportunities it's not fair blah, blah blah whereas i tend to think everyone plays a role i think you need an immediate lens in order to get a uh, dj a Dr. Rubenstein, right? You need these people in order to kind of fester somebody else. I think without them, you don't have the reaction. So you need that thing that you hate, that thing that you despise in order to force a reaction. I'm pretty sure, um, what's his name? Uh, like Dead Mouse, all those kind of people. I'm pretty sure in the EDM world, there's kids that grow up and think, oh, those guys are corny, right? And they want to, have, and they want to provide a different way of presenting an EDM, or they think that, oh, I can do this thing better. And you react to it by doing the work, by putting yourself out there, not by criticizing on behind your keyboard, but you decide, you know what, I'm going to start DJing too, but I'm going to do it a different way. I'm going to do it. It's all about the music. It's not going to be about this helmet stuff. I'm going to, I don't know, whatever your your thinking is. So I think these people are, they play an integral role. Number one, in appeasing the general masses, because there's going to be people out there, general fan people that just want, you know. Uh, cookie cutter microwavable instant kind of music that sounds like that or whatever and there's going to be people that want the other stuff so they, they all play into each other but the immediate lens thing is interesting because i think a lot of it has to do with what she looks like i think unfortunately because she's a former model um it just i'm a sh I'm, I'm i'm sure if you spoke to her honestly she would admit that some of the opportunities that came to her were partly because she could dj proficiently and the fact that she looks amazing on camera right those things are not going to hurt your overall appeal your overall creative trajectory i think everyone has to be aware that you know it's entertainment it's art it's creative culture it's creative it's creativity in, in general so you're having to kind of in general um you're having to present yourself in a way right presentation is very important the way you present yourself the way you conduct yourself on social media the way you play your songs how you conduct yourself behind the decks is all adds to it. i mentioned i mentioned before about dj harvey reason why i like dj harvey and ricardo lobos is 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 it's mostly about who, who they are as a person away from the music right it's not even about the decks it's about what they what they represent um how they compose themselves what they talk about in interviews the lack of interviews that they give in terms of ricardo villalobos's case those all add to the enigmatic factor that adds their dj as a fan so if immediately lends if she lends it if she leans into no pun intended her looks and whatever it may be then well, there's no harm behind it and if promoters think if promoters can recognize that she gets a megazillion if, if 
all you gotta do is go in boiler room and see the people that get the most views just book them on a festival so if you're seeing this girl gets more views than any other person i don't blame the promoter for booking them right i just think they play different roles but i also don't think if you're an underground dj or female underground dj you necessarily need to be sniping at Amelia Lenz. Like, that probably isn't someone you need to be conversating with. She's not even in your same bracket. It's about creating your own little scene, creating your own little niche. And at the end of the day, really, I think even for me, having DJed in a bar or continue DJing in bars now, the dream isn't just to, like, you know, to be a high-flying DJ going all over the world. The dream is just to be able to play this music all the every single day, have no, jo- have no job apart from being a DJ, sustain yourself, be able to pay rent, be able to pay your bills, pay your mortgage, take your wife or boyfriend out for a couple of dinners here and there, go on holiday, you know, be able to buy your parents some nice stuff. And that's it. That's kind of the, the requirements. Just be want to be able to sustain yourself on a salary of, let's say, £1,500 a month playing music that you love, right? That's as opposed to going to working for the man. So the fact that you're sniping at somebody that's earning the most amount in the DJs, like the kind of top 1%, isn't necessarily fair because they're playing a particular role and everyone else is playing another role. But anyway, this thread on Techno Subreddit says, what about Amelia Lynn? So this um, post on Amelia Amelia Lynn and the following. This um, this guy on here said, um, lately everywhere I look, I've been bombarded with Amelia Lynn's. so um the marketing is ridiculous when did all this happen she's headlining almost every festival and being promoted like crazy yet all i hear from her is generic big room acid anyone seen her in the club or festival i wasn't impressed to be honest is this me or is that simply marketing now that's a valid question and i think by and large i would have to agree i've never really been a fan of her djing i think it's probably in that kind of realm of just playing all the bangers for an hour which i don't mind but it's not for me personally i think it's not her fault that she gets booked for big festival stages and big nights and big clubs. She plays really, you know, a particular kind of techno, a particular kind of electronic music that's suited to that kind of one hour, one hour, one hour, one hour, one hour, 32 hour kind of banger set. She can do really, really well. Anything apart from that, it kind of starts to uh, dip down a little bit in quality. But again, it's all horses for courses. I prefer to see DJs that are playing, you know, for six hours at a time or four hours at a time. That's what I kind of like to see or, a, or a, probably a bit more of an eclectic taste. It's not for me, but I also think it serves a purpose, right? If you go and see her play at Coachella, you might want to see her play a banging one hour and a half techno set of all bangers. You don't really want to hear her go through a, a soundscape of tunes because there's not enough time to do that in an hour 30. You need longer to do that. And maybe the sets she's doing, maybe what she prefers is to come in one hour 30 and fuck off. Do you know what I mean? I, which I don't have a problem with. But the issue is that, unfortunately, this is where the artist has to come in and kind of tell their promoters to pump the brakes once they become popular, once a DJ pops, you see, you saw it happening with Seth Stroxler, you saw it happening with Dixon, but he was, he was able to pull back. You saw it happening with DJ Harvey when he got his green card, he was able to pull back. You see it happened to Jamie Jones during the whole Hot Creations times. There comes a point when a DJ blows, Luciano back in the day, Ricardo Lobos back in the day when he kind of blew up, and Marco Carolla, um, Solomon. When they get really popular, Dax J, um, Rod Had, um, Bruce for a little bit. Like, when they blow, it, that machine just goes, kudum, right? It doesn't, they don't particularly, get, there's no gears. They just go all the way to 10. And I think it's the responsibility of the DJ or the artist to be like, hey, management, agent, let's relax a bit. Because what happens is that, like in all music, right, some of the biggest people are probably the, the, the masters of it, right? The Beyonce's, the Jay-Z's, the Kanye's, the Drake's, um, the Rihanna's. They're the masters of the idea of, like, when you're at the top of the pinnacle, you have to know that this music is so... I don't know. It's been it, there's so much quick turnaround behind it. The attention spans are so short. Everyone says the same thing, but essentially people get bored of you very quickly. So the fact that what you can do in order to kind of build demand, same with you know um, this um, serendipitous moment with DJ Harvey, where he overstayed his visa and he couldn't leave America. That five year period, or ever how long that period was, built up a desire and a demand to see this guy again. So as a DJ, the thing you have to really be conscious of is that you can't overexpose yourself. You need to be able to balance the idea of like. You know, making loads of money, um, understanding that it's a very short window, if, especially if you're the kind of DJ like that Amelia Lens is, you, you, you're, you're aware that maybe in 20 year time or 10 years time, people won't more want to see you. It's the same demand they want to see you now. And you need to kind of milk it as much as you can. And if you're smart with your money and you invest and you buy some property, like um, who that I heard speaking about it, like fucking Danny Days, he, he's, uh, he's got property, he, you know, he's invested in some sort of smart stuff. That could then sustain you for the long term. And then in general, you're just DJing for fun and you've got money kind of in the background that's kind of paying your rent and allowing you to kind of uh, live your lifestyle as you please. But you have to be very conscious about that balance, about making sure that you're not overexposed. Because that's what ends up happening. Because now it's not a conversation about whether or not she's a good DJ. It's um, about a conversation of like, she's being forced down my throat and I feel like I, I can't say that I don't like her because everyone else likes her. Same with Peggy Goo. Same with the Black Madonna. 
Same with Nastia. Same all these people. All these girls shut up the way. That's what they're suffering from. It's like overexposure. But I also understand in their regard that it's a short, it's a short window, man. Yeah, you, you don't have that long to kind of make that much, that kind of money, especially once you're red hot, right? Why not kind of lean into it? And as well, I would think. I don't know what if not it's true or not, which is kind of the, the 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 side bit about life is that in general, especially in the entertainment world, for the most part, female actresses or female actors um, tend to um, their earning capabilities tends to diminish the older they get especially if you're somebody that relies a lot on your looks right um i don't know why it is is way hollywood is like that where you know the in the opposite in the men's field the older you get the more money you're getting right al pacino robert and all these guys are working you know continuously of course because they've got great directors that kind of want to work with them but for the most part most hot women tend to kind of dip or no, to tend to kind of have a low in their career when they get older because usually, I don't know if it's the production companies or if it's the investment bankers or if it's the flipping directors, tend to usually always go for like the younger, hot thing that's out and about. So that may be influencing the DJ decisions too nowadays, right? In the DJ suit, like these girls probably think, you know what? I'm only going to look this hot for a period of time and I need to take advantage of it, which again, you don't have any issue with. But I think this is this is what happens when you're overexposed. It's less about her as a DJ and more so about her being pushed in your face, which is a real, real shame. Um, some other um, some other um, quotes here from another post that says the following. Um, you got to make a buck somehow. Musicians' careers are like athletes' careers as well, as like I mentioned, in a way. Their window to make good money can be quite small. Sometimes they have to exploit it while they can. Look at Danny Days, for example. Big release on Hot Nature, uh, Crock Craze 2012. Now writes whatever the fuck he wants. Right? That's true. Danny Days kind of gave a really good example, I think, on Rave Curious, where he spoke about how uncomfortable... I think he spoke about even the Resident Advisor article, how uncomfortable he was with the big release on Hot Creations. And he kind of, you know, wasn't comfortable with the scene he was getting associated with and where he was playing. And as well... The, the thing about producing, I'd, I'd assume, same with Danny Dades, is that what you produce or what blows or what kind of pop makes you pop no, won't necessarily be the song that you necessarily... Like, they always say, it's like, what is that? I've been a... What's that phrase? Something like that. You've been... um I've been a... What's that thing called? um An overnight success 10 years in the making, right? The idea of, like, you've been working diligently all, all this time for 10 years, putting out SoundCloud tunes. No one's been paying attention. There's one tune you put out, blows up, but then it sounds nothing like your previous catalog. It's just something you're experimenting with. Then suddenly you're getting booked to play in places where they play that kind of music. That's not the music that you actually play to DJ. And then when you go there and you get bored of playing this, that music that doesn't really represent you, people completely get turned off and like, oh, who the fuck's that? I don't want to hear that shit. So I understand the kind of that trepidation that comes with it. Um, so that's what it says there. What else? Any other good comments here to mention? On one hand, she's filling an important role in this scene, which is essentially catering for the masses at the beginning fair weather techno scenes as a genre exposed in popularity. Her mass appeal can be attributed to a mixture of good marketing, charisma, influence, and safe popular music choices. Um, every genre naturally has those type of players. Again, which I said before, it's inevitable. That said, I get why more uh, involved fans of the genre, i.e. other DJs and producers, might be frustrated and look down on the fact that she basically tracks, um, she basically lacks any sort of subtlety and plays the most obvious techno choices music choices in order to appeal to masses it's sort of like when somebody first goes into a genre and just downloads the top 100 charts instead of curating a personal selection anybody can do that but only the most clever lucky charismatic few end up getting away with it the rest of us have to dig or else bring something unique to the table all this aside i'm from the middle of canada where techno is generally still incredible underground so i jump at the chance to see her just for the party i, I trust she brings it exactly there, there we go so everything you said before is completely true there is this idea that you know there are everyone's got a role to play i don't think that she's taking away any jobs from or taking a spot from any underground dj for the most part i don't think they have the they're not even in the same conversation in terms of booking in terms of fee in terms of all that exposure and sort of stuff in terms of um gate in terms of just in general as well there's a there is a a reality check too in terms of just how many people you can actually bring to a club clubs are Clubs must take, clubs must, you know, it must cost an arm and a leg to run a club. I always have aspirations of having my own bar, right? Similar to like Le Deux Cafe, the, the legendary bar that Michelle Lamy had. But I don't, I didn't, I'd imagine running an actual club or a bar must cost an arm and a leg to do, especially the first couple of years or the first four years. It must be brutal running a bar, no one there, all the setup costs, paying security, running out of money. It must be insane. So there must be something to the idea that there are some people that are just, it's unfortunate. If, not, if you don't like them a lot but they're able to bring people to the club they can bring people through the door they are box office uh popularity there's nothing you can contest about it so that's been acceptance with some people with some artists that hey you're not in the same conversation as this person they just bring in more people through the door it's, and it's unfortunate it's on it, it gets on your nerves it's annoying but there's nothing you can do they just they just they're just bigger right they're just a bigger person it is what it is um 
And again, like I said, I think nowadays with the success or the, with the popularity of techno, the actual the good thing I think that's happening now at the moment, especially with somebody like a, like an Amini Lens, or uh, so with this popularity of people that are blowing up with business techno, whatever you call it, casual techno, is that it's opening the floodgates to everybody. Everyone's getting exposed to the sound. So eventually, what ends up happening for the most part, you you come into a, a genre, you get exposed to one person. And then through a series of events and through a series of kind of just digging deep and reading pay, reading websites and going on Instagram pages, you get exposed to other artists that lead to other artists. And you suddenly go through a rabbit hole and suddenly you get exposed to a whole different scene. So they're a good gateway drug. Because I think, you know, you can't get a worse. There's, you can't really say they're a bad gateway drug to flipping electronic music scene. Peggy Goo, Black Madonna, um, Nastia, uh, Amelia Lenz. They're pretty decent, I think, as a gateway drug to come into a scene. I'm not really mad at it personally. So again, I'm not... I have sympathy for her, and I get—I understand people that are annoyed by it. But I think in general, if she's not for you, just keep it moving and get somebody else in general. Right? Let's see what she's posted so far. I haven't been on Instagram in a while. Let's see what she's posted on here. But yeah, this Instagram thing might be annoying. But again, I, I don't know. This is the social media age we live in, isn't it? She should she should take advantage of everything that's kind of like at her hands right now at the moment. I don't really see a problem with it personally. Um, let's see the picture of it here. But yeah, here's her Instagram page that she kind of updates quite popular again. But yeah, you can see she serves a purpose, isn't it? It's quite just cool to see DJ that looks like this behind the decks, isn't it? That isn't the same sort of dude that you always see at festivals. And she she seems to play really good music. She has nice merch on as well. That looks really nice. People tend to like it as well. Yeah, why not? I don't see it. I don't really see a problem with it personally. Um... She's talking about her what? What's, what's really guys? I'm so excited! Finally, share the winning design of the Jochim Roka. This is the first official um, exhale what OFC merch ever, and will be exclusively for sale during the 24-hour event at Awakenings. Um, only 90 pieces in black and 90 pieces in white, so you need to get there fast. You know what? I'm surprised more DJs don't do more merch. I think maybe it's a corny thing. They get afraid of what. I would buy merch off a DJ selling it at the booth any day of the week, man. If a big DJ played somewhere and bought some merch with them, I'd buy it right there. I don't tend to buy it online because I can't be able to wait and it's EU shipping where I saw Malaki. But I don't tell why more DJs don't bring a box of merch with them and just sling it at the event. Maybe it's a bit, you know, it's not a cool thing for the bar. I don't know. I, I don't know. It's it's a strange thing. I don't know why people don't do more merch, especially nowadays, like DJs being... Do you remember when everyone was wearing those t-shirts with the DJ's birthdays, um take inspiration for the Givenchy uh, date of birthing. I think Ricardo Tishi had the date of birth, like he's 74, whatever it is, Tishi. And everyone started doing the t-shirts of DJs like Dixon, whatever. Da, da, da. That, that time was probably not the best time because it wasn't maybe as popular as mainstream as it was nowadays. But nowadays, I think those shirts will probably do really well if they came about, if they were fresh nowadays. And I guess the designers putting out prints on ever press on that sort of malarkey I'll, I'll be i'd be i'd be down to wear the, uh, my favorite dj's merch like I'd, I'd be on it especially if they sold it at the kind of event where i'm there in it um the, the t-shirt's quite cool i quite like the design i'm not, I'm not mad at it at all um t-shirt thing at the back excel i will be make sure they don't sell out during the night so people with late entry tickets can also get them there's also another design which i'll show you soon that will also be available i also like to say thanks to everyone who participated in this contest i saw so many great designs and it was not easy decision thank you all oh wow she picked a designer again that that's again reason why someone like that is successful right that connection to the fans people feel as if they know her she's getting people to put post up and design things and she's choosing winners there's no you know it's not it's not surprising that she's become as popular as she is nowadays but um yeah okay I'm, I'm not mad at it personally i don't really have a problem with her i think it's cool to see i think it's a good change video of her playing in where is this in fabric is this fabric in madrid i think isn't it in, in spain is it fabric in spain i think so she didn't come to tell me how it's done there you go, she's smashing it. Good girl. Mondays what? Mondays, what's the teacher say? Mondays. She's quite good at the dancing as well. There's people holding signs in the rave, which is quite cool. Instagram stories. But yeah, I don't have a problem with it whatsoever, man. Oh, she's got, oh, she's got the clear decks. Is that the clear decks or the white decks? I know it's a white decks. I thought it's a clear. Video. People in her team are taking videos for her. Yeah, no, I'm not mad at it, man. She's smashing it. Oh, she's playing back like a bank block. That's a good little collaboration there. I like that. I'm not mad at it, man. I'm not mad at it. I think everyone's got their place to play in, in the techno scene. Having some breakfast and stuff. Premiere of her track with this guy, Aerod. Yeah, okay, cool. I'm not mad at it, man. I'm not mad at it. Like I said, everyone's got their, their role to play. Let's all be family. Let's all be friends. Let's all get along with each other and not be mean and stuff. And let people live how they want. 
Next on the list here, we have people not happy about DJs sharing audience pictures or videos, which is interesting to say the least, right? Very interesting um, topic here on Techno Against Subreddit. You know when people post those videos of themselves in a crowd? No, of them in an event, right? So the videos, you know, oh my God, I've seen this DJ play. Cool, amazing. So some DJs are annoyed at people posting those things because essentially they're not they're not in, in, in the moment, right? In the present moment. They're not interacting with themselves. They're not having a good time. But then someone on, on Reddit made a really good point that it's the DJs that keep sharing those posts on their social media stories that encourage people to post these things, which is quite interesting, right? And this is the post here. I'm going to read that to you guys. Um, so the following. Um, why are techno DJs um, reposting the audience stories on Instagram? I mean, I get that you have a presence on social media these days, um, uh, these days and want to seem as close as you can with your fans. But I believe that this is reposting audience Instagram stories. They are massively promoting the behavior they keep on complaining about. I mean, isn't it obvious that people are going to take way more videos and experience less of the moment if they're constantly hoping at this time a he or she will repost it on their page? Ran over. Have a nice weekend, everyone. Which is, I, I have a good point exactly. My thoughts exactly. Ah, so this, some person at the point here says, I totally, as someone who totally agrees that removing ourselves from experiencing a full capacity in an event, the moment is unhealthy. But also as somebody who truly understands how valuable and social social media can actually be at the end of the day i think it's actually worse to learn to to lean to one side of the argument more so than the other than to be accepting the fact that the healthy combination of both is achievable which i which i understand pull out your phone once or twice which i'm a big fan of take a picture if you want to to capture the moment but standing there and recording the whole thing is just insane especially because most of the time you're not going to rewatch it yourself no one's going to care that you posted it online it just doesn't matter, especially nowadays with most of the big events being recorded anyway and being put up online, like stuff like Junction 2, there was, there was you know, professional recorded videos with crowd reactions and all that sort of stuff posted up online for free on Mix Mag and DJ Mag for on DJ Mag YouTube pages. So you taking your own video it doesn't really make any sense unless you want to just have it for your own records. Um, so I tend to take out my, my phone once or twice, if not anything, right? Um, and for friends that aren't there, with all, for, for all means, I do it too. And sometimes I'm so in the moment that I honestly don't even care to pull it out. Like sometimes, you know, if you're, oh, pull it out. Woo -woo -woo. Um, sometimes the same sort of thing, like when you go to a good restaurant and you're having a great meal, you forget to post it on social because you're just so engrossed in the moment, so engrossed in the kind of the food you're eating. It's like, oh, so tasty. Um, so it continues here. Uh, with that being said, if a DJ reposts a few stories on their audience, they're also just engaging with people and showing appreciation for the exposure they're providing it adds a value to the social social episode of social media but man you're right some leaders overdo it so much that some people from the audience do and definitely don't diminish things so yeah uh, i feel you on this one but there's also two sides to a coin which i definitely agree i think if you're not becoming dj and you're getting some good crowd reaction the people are posting stories and saying oh this guy that played that mixed guy was fucking awesome and you're nobody i think it's quite nice to share that on your social you feel quite chuffed like oh my god fuck someone noticed right all these years i've been playing and no one gives a shit about why i play and suddenly someone's giving me a good reaction i love that but in general i don't know i tend to kind of stay away from that sort of stuff I tend to kind of just go and have a good time I, t I like to have the memory of the night instead of you know looking back on videos i don't really care for um again maybe it's you just want to show your friends and show that you know they had a good time and if they kind of missed out on it you want to maybe feel make them make them feel good about it i don't know but for me i'm not a fan personally i'd rather just go without it i'd rather go without it and just kind of you know enjoy the night as a punter and keep it moving but you know maybe i'm in the minority in that one who knows Move on to this one, uh, Five Ways to Save the Nightlife, which is a really cool article from one of the founders of the new warehouse project in Manchester that looks fucking banging. Have you guys seen it? They've, they've, um, they've reopened warehouse project in Manchester. Um, I think it's, um, let me see if I can find it here. I think I've got the, look. yeah, this is the location, right? Warehouse project, warehouse project, Instagram. Let me see if I can find it. They've got an Instagram profile where they post some of the stuff on there, but it looks fucking banging, right? Warehouse project Manchester has relaunched. I think it's in another place that looks really cool. <laughs> that i'm a big fan of um let me see if i can get up on you on the screen is the instagram here yep 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 i got it up on here flume's playing very very soon oh my god that's gonna be awesome hopefully he doesn't eat somebody out on stage again but who knows <laughs> um that's it so yeah there's a great great article here from esquire it says how to save the uk's nightlife five easy steps um the warehouse project session lord who's also one of the nightlife what is he the nightlife the night czar for manchester but imagine look at our night look at their night in manchester right is this guy is a former founder of um warehouse project and uh, the hacienda or something else he's got a story he's got a really deep history and experience about running clubs and running club nights and you've got the amy lammy woman that we got here who does what comedy nights and 
I don't know what what does she know in the nightlife? She's not. I've never seen her out. I've never seen her about. I don't know anyone that knows her that you know hanging out socially. She, it's just a complete devoid. It's she just she's. You couldn't get someone more disconnected from the scene than Amy Lammy. You couldn't get someone more plugged into the Manchester scene than this guy, Sasha Lord. So this following, right? Um, this is an article from Esquire. It says the following here: the big British night out is endangered. Last year, twenty-one percent of clubs across the country closed, and after five steady years, the Guardian reported that last year, roughly two hundred million has been wiped off the value of UK clubs since two thousand thirteen. No surprise. Some fear the lights might be coming up on the UK culture as we know it. Lost London lost fifty percent of its venues between two thousand eleven and two thousand sixteen. Fifty percent. You know how insane that is. Those fifty percent of the venues are the reason why 50, more people are coming to London to hang out and to have a good time, and you're cutting them off because you don't want the noise or whatever it's just a bizarre way to do things according to the mayor's office right despite the numbers of um stabilizing since amy lammy sadiq khan's night czar she's fucking awful has come in for criticism for once some quarters especially when hackney council brought in curfews 11 p.m in a week and midnight on weekends for east london's vibrant clubs bars in july 18th and even lammy or khan have power over licensing laws though and the impression that our nightlife is now on the mercy of developers is lingering of course right but it's not just um it, of course the hackney thing was more there's more nuances, more layers to it. A lot of the residents were annoyed. A lot of the clubs also were very lax and very um, um, careless with how they um, conducted their clubs. They weren't necessarily looking after the, the community. They weren't necessarily making sure patrons weren't pissing on the walls or taking a piss of the local area. So the, essentially the council, the local residents just got fed up with the clubs. That's essentially what happened. There are some pressure from the developers too, but they just got fed up. The developers offered them a, another route that you know essentially um, required them just to sign over the you know the permission or to kind of build some massive skyscraper that's made out of glass and, and aluminium that is or glass and steel that isn't going to cause any trouble as opposed to like a basement bar i kind of get it um but still amy lammy and Sadiq khan are absolutely useless in terms of actually enforcing or actually enacting any kind of change in london in that regard um it's not just london either notable res recent casualties include the mint in leeds which closed in march blaming redevelopment so what do we do sasha lord has a plan he's one of the key men running manchester's clubbing institute warehouse project right he's involved in the warehouse project that's like Amy Lamont being involved in print works. Would that happen? Probably not. Or fold? Probably not, right? And Parklight Festival. Since June 2018, he's been the Greater Manchester Night Czar, advising Mayor Andy Burnham on the region's nighttime economy. So imagine all these examples that we went to pick from Berlin, Amsterdam. We've got an, we've got an example right here on our own shores in Manchester up the road, right? That's doing things perfectly, and we don't take we don't take their example for it. Why? Why don't we take any lessons from what they're doing? doesn't make any sense um the plan uh the plan lords come up with um with for burnham the greater manchester nighttime economy blueprint is specifically aimed at the city's 10 boroughs but it might just be a, uh, a philip that britain nightlife needs right cool oh, is it, maybe it's the same idea that i had about having one kind of like full type place in each area of london north north south east west right so then essentially you kind of um uh, decrease the strain on smaller bars and pubs because then people know they have another place to go to if they want to go and get fucked up maybe on the phone lords earnest and today lords lords earnest and today particularly buoyant i've I've just seen david the gay sign a new country of the night he explained so that's made my day lord who's from um wittenshaw in south uh, manchester has been putting on nights in manchester since 1994 he found the warehouse project with his friend sam candle holding their first party 26 at the old um boddington's brewery in strange ways or to the north of the city centre. The high security prison of the same name was next door and Lord and Khan got complaints from the warden that the sound from the public enemy set had turned the prison into a rave. He's a fan of Lammy's work in London. Mm, politically correct, I don't think he is. And he's upbeat about the state of the UK nightlife despite 27% dropped in Grand Manchester clubs. For one thing, he says the stats don't tell the full story. The club category includes the bars and the plays and music rather than the specialist nightclubs you might think of. The blueprint picks out five priorities. Safety, transport, diversity, skills and well-being and regeneration. With fewer police on the streets, after nearly a decade of austerity, the blueprint says people are feeling less safe on nights out, so they have to look after each other. So safety have havens where clubbers can chill out a bit, or sober up, or change their charge their phone, or find their mates, or have a cup of tea and talk. Have been trialed in Manchester, and then will soon hit Wigan and Bolton. So far, they've proved the hit, which I which I makes sense. I think if you've ever been to a, on a night out, especially on a strip in a town like Manchester <laughs> and Liverpool, you know people go hard. So to have an area where someone can actually chill out, charge their phone, find their mates have a cup of tea before they head out and get because usually you know most clubs and bars just chuck you out right you get fucked you get drunk and just they just throw you out into the streets and that's what causes all the trouble and all the madness you see all these ambulances all around the place but this makes more sense um blah 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 
Um, transport is less is easily fixed outside of London. Privatized buses, trams, and trains tend to stop running around midnight. It's not just clubbers scrapping for surge charge. Ubers. Lord said, fifty three percent of people working in Manchester nighttime economy earn less than living wage. The travel takes a big chunk of that. They are being hit with penalised officials. Uh, Burnham has also just just suggested another push for a local control on transport. The last two options, regeneration and diversity, are of openings are interweaved. Lord it remembers when shopping. Uh, mega lift that traffic center open and suck the life out of high street across greater manchester internet shopping ratcheted up the pressure take Alchon for instance i think our base base bastion of culture was weatherspoons and that was practically about it but a revived co- covered market uh triggered the whole vegetation of the town some really good independent bars and independent restaurants popped up and the purple flag of waters diver- of diversity and safe night out will follow the year a decade of austerity hasn't helped, but Lord says local decision making is vital. I think the mayor's doing is trying to drag as many powers into the city region as possible, which is awesome. Then there's also the tale as old as time, the song as old as rhyme, you'll find a nightclub restaurant as being operated. So yeah, great, great, um great suggestions from him in general. I think by by comparison to what's going on in London, what they're doing in Manchester seems like a lot more forward thinking, a lot more interesting than what we're doing here. I hope the next night czar that we get after Amy Lammy, because I don't know how long is she going to be in power for as well. Like she's there forever, isn't it? Someone else needs to kind of get voted in. Hopefully, somebody that is of the culture has some connection to the culture and isn't just some like vapid person that no one gives a shit about and doesn't really you know just stands on the sidelines and goes to events and shakes people's hands. But again, going forward, I think those are some nice areas to concentrate on. Warehouse Project looks fucking interesting. I can't wait to go visit it myself. I've got some images here from Warehouse Project. Flume is playing there very soon with Ross from Friends or uh, when Wednesday the. 13th of november we've got image here of who's this um mk and gorgon city playing which looks fucking awesome another cool video here it looks just really good isn't it, doesn't it mk playing imagine that yeah it looks fucking so much fun man it looks like so much fun i can't wait to go there this Den- dennis salter playing here the Dennis Soto, right? or Joseph, was it Marco Joseph Caparelli, or Joseph Marco Corolla and Joseph Caparelli playing back to back? That should be good. I'm looking forward to going. Man. Has anyone been to Wales Project so far, Manchester? Let me know in the comments. I'll be interested to see, hear what you guys think of it. Oh, Honey Dijon played. That must have been mad, isn't it? Look at that. Look at how that looks from the back door. That looks amazing. Such Instagram ready. Whatever, like the lights. I'm not a fan of. Everyone's phones are on, but you know what can you do in that regard? But it looks fucking gorgeous, doesn't it? Honey DJ on playing, the drops and coming. Wow. Awesome. Can't wait, man. Can't wait to go visit myself. But yeah, uh, big up, um, big up Session Lord. What he's doing there with the warehouse project in general is amazing. And I can't wait to come to your club, my friend. It looks fucking cool. Next on here, reusable water bottles. I hate them. I hate people that have reusable water bottles. I hate. In, there's nothing worse than enthusiastic water drinkers. There's nothing worse than people who make water drinking into some kind of workout that, you know, the person that eats fucking 17 donuts, 18 Kinder Buenos, but suddenly has a bottle of water next to them and keeps sipping on it as if that's going to, you know, alleviate some of the stresses that they're causing to their livers, arteries, and their cholesterol levels of all the um, amount of, you know, artificial flavorings and, you know, stupid sugars that they're ingesting in their bodies. It gets to my nerves. It gets to my nerves. But it's also interesting. Um, trend that's happening at the moment where people are you know going out of their way to buy the reusable water bottles in order to kind of I don't know carry water around with them so they're kind of saving the environment not buying plastic bottled water and that malarkey but I drink so much water day in day out I don't need to carry this sort of shit with me I don't need another thing that in my position I don't need to carry around a fucking bottle around me you've got already a massive smartphone in your skinny jeans I've got my big wallet full of massive massive cash because I'm rich and I'm famous and I don't want to be having this fucking water bottle on the side of my hand gripping it as I'm walking down the street and imagine losing a water bottle that cost you 25 quid that's annoying that's a that's annoying and i'm pretty sure if these things are desirable accessories as it says here in a, in a high snow high um, article if they're if they're desirable accessories or cool accessories there's probably going to be people on the other end who want to take your cool accessory without paying for it i.e thieves i.e um people that you know don't have any money i.e fucking scumbags right there's pretty sure there's a big market for black mar- imagine there's a big market for black market reusable water bottles how skanky do you have to be to buy a used reward water bottle that's madness isn't it to save what a couple of quid and probably people would want to do that people will want to do that this is amazing so this article from the house to buy this is a reusable water bottle is the coolest accessory you ever buy like come on really really cool accessory of course 
Okay, so here we go. Um, everyone knows plastic bottles and paper cups are bad. Does do they though? Do they know that? I don't think everyone knows that. I think some people are pushing this agenda onto us, but we don't. Everyone knows this. But that doesn't uh, make eradicating them from your daily life easy. Whether buying water at the gym or picking up a morning coffee, more urban life feels more impossible to navigate without damaging the planet long term. If only there was a some kind of solution. Environmental campaigners have been urging people to invest in reusable bottles for ages. We produce more waste than the planet is handle. Almost too logical way to do it to fair for context america purchases 50 billion plastic bottle water bottles a year Gee, that's a lot of water bottles isn't it fair enough but maybe these things have, have a use averaging 13 bottles per month for everyone in the u.s so by using a reusable bottle you as an individual could save an average of 156 bottles annually that's pretty cool to dole out a much bastardized word a reusable was a used reusable water bottle is a sustainable choice but if saving the world isn't enough incentive to start using a reusable bottle perhaps you'll be swayed by the fact that they now wait for it um a bona fide fashion accessory environmentalists have been championing the cause for ages but now reusable bottles are cool so imagine being an environmentalist imagine actually caring about the planet going out your way to attend these rallies going to conferences where no one cared and now the only reason why people care about reusable bottles because they're cool because you want to be posted up on Instagram with you crossing your legs, um, looking out onto the sunset, um, doing some weird pose, jumping up into a star sign, whatever it may be, being a visco guy or girl and drinking your water. But that's the reason why people are using it. Not because of your message, not because of the environmental benefits, but because it's cool. How annoying, man, that's, must that be if you're an environmentalist? You must be so sick to your stomach. It must be such a weird, comforted place to be in. You've got a lot of people now using reusable bottles and saving over 150 bottles per year of plastic, but then also they're only doing it for the image. Oh, my God. Exhibit A, Jonah Hill, who has been sulking around. Again, Jonah Hill, not the most, you know, uh, what the most healthy-looking dude in the world, bit overweight, but he drinks a lot of water. Example, example, yeah, exhibit A for me, right? I, I, I don't think I've met anyone that... Everyone I've met that's an excessive drink of water is, you know, morbidly obese for the most part, right? There's no one I've met who's an excessive drink of water, has a bottle in their hand, who's kind of fit. Most of the time, it's always the kind of overweight person that has to compensate for the fact that they went out to pret a manger and bought a fucking, you know, macaroni and cheese, uh, um, you know, pasta bake or some shit and a baguette and a sandwich and a couple of brownies, right? And they're offsetting with a bottle of water. It's like, come on, really? Really? You can't offset shit. Or people that walk to, or people that force you to walk, no, people that kind of say you should, or no, people that work who kind of scoff at you when you try and get in the lift, right? Like, oh, it's only a couple of work. No, this stairs aren't my workout. I go to the gym every day for an hour or I go running in the morning five miles and more or three miles and more. I don't need to walk the stairs in order to kind of get my exercise. I do my exercise before work or after work, at lunch, whatever. I work out. I don't need to offset my um, lack of working out by walking up some stairs. What's that going to do? It's locomotion. It's not working out. Like, what the fuck is this? Anyway, John Hill, who has been sulking around Soho, Catching the absolute unit that is a 64 ounce half gallon hydro flask, which he has customized with stickers as if it were a skate deck or a MacBook. Given his relationship with the all birds wearing climate champ Leonardo DiCaprio, Hill is not now aware by this is so cringe. You must laugh yourself writing this, no? By now, the global warming is slowly obliterating the planet. I'm writing this article in a 100 degree Fahrenheit heat in Barcelona for fuck's sake. But he also knows that the bottle adds a certain je ne sais quoi to his I just rolled out of bed and still look cool as fuck aesthetic. Does he look cool though? I don't know if he looks cool cool man i don't know i don't know um yeah man yeah smoking cigarettes but you've got a bottle of gallon that is that is essentially that is essentially the hypocrisy of people nowadays right in the picture of jonah hill here with his hood up manning his own business having a morning stroll doing going about what he's doing but he's smoking a cigarette but he's got a, a, a six was that what they say um uh a 64 ounce gallon of reusable water bottle covered in stickers cool man Healthy. Lake, uh, like Hill, Shay LaBeouf is also a fashion wild card, the original fashion wild card. In fact, LaBeouf knows a thing or two about vintage tees, night, night kicks that are long out of production, but also he understands the importance of staying hydrated all the time. After all, this guy who would literally lug around a gallon like a nighty skate kid, no question asked, keeping there at all times. LaBeouf has now moved to the hydro fast because almost big hills. But most of these people are like, you know, wasn't, wasn't, um, Jonah, wasn't, um, Shayla Buff like a an addict or you know used to be an alcoholic. So I guess you have to offset that desire to always pick up a, a a glass of whiskey by having a hydro flask, maybe. I don't know, but <clears throat> or that one. Reusable bottles don't begin and end at hydro flask, however, with the plenty of brands coming together with some sweet designs of their own. Easy friendly canteen and collaboration. What? Phipps Easy Friendly Canteen in collaboration with Clean is one of the biggest sellers, while online ceramics Neglin bottle has proved to be popular. There's there's a Yeezy bottle. 
There's a Yeezy um, thingy bottle. Is there really? What is this? What? Okay, sorry, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not doing that. Um, so yeah, they've got the Virgil bottle on here, drop a rainbow. I don't know, man. These things are $28. Um, another one by Silent and Naglin is $30. One that Supreme did. The Hydro Flask is $30 for an 18 ounce. You've got another Naglin plastic one. You've got another Virgil Labo Soma one that's $50. Dot active one, urban bottle, silicon. Some interesting designs. That's the one I'm seeing more popular in my a different workplace I work in. The place I work in now, people will carry this one. It's called Swell, a water bottle. $52 at Harvey Nichols. Fucking hell. Insane, isn't it? Water's become big business, isn't it? It's only a matter of time before some big person gets behind it and starts pumping them out. But yeah, that's insane, really. That's insane, isn't it? Look at that. That is the image of a the hypocrisy of nowadays, isn't it? You're smoking cigarettes, yet you're drinking loads of water. Okay, man okay but yeah i'm not down for it not not keen i think everyone that uses um maybe a, 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 unless maybe shayla both looks like he works out most people have seen that drink excessive amounts of water in the day and always are going to the flipping um because back in the day do you remember back in the day when you used to get water it used to be a chance to gossip now people are doing it as like a weird weird virtual signal and they're going to go get some water and drink that it's like what the fuck is wrong with you go and work out like run some stairs do some burpees like the fuck anyway what do i know what do i know next on the list here we have oh the basement in nike air max have you seen this this looks pretty interesting and pretty cool nike um uh, basement are launching a collaboration with nike which is amazing the basement i'm sure you guys are aware of it is an amazing uh, facebook group that's essentially built around streetwear and sneaker culture a lot of young kids use it it's basically the young kids version of crooked tongues in some way shape or form it's basically taking the best of forum culture and presented it onto a facebook group where a lot of people are really nice to each other there's a lot of goodwill a lot of conversation a lot of debate happens there i'd never really i'm, I'm part of it but i never really check it for the most part but i think for the kids that are on it they get a lot of value from it and over time of course the basement has become like the it's a good little um what would you say uh, what would you say um it's a good sort of like um sample base or a good place for brands to go to in order to kind of connect with customers or something like because there are loads of youth young people there and somehow these kids of the basement that founded it were clever enough to somehow make the basement facebook page into a business they've gone office and all that sort of stuff from studio they do uh, projects and whatever collaboration with brands and i think for them personally i'd assume doing a collaboration with nike is probably the pinnacle of it right they've achieved the, the apex of the mountain they've able to collaborate with the brand that they've kind of been set for, for, for the very beginning um so yeah um here it is the basement um collaboration with nike um i'll put it up on here on the screen this is the one this is the what's this one i think it might be the manchester i don't know which one it is but this is the um article from here from the nike um page says the following debut in 1999 happy design we know that anyway let's crawl along the mx90 receiving a special treatment from london collected the basement a group of young uk create young uk creators the basement formed a vibrant community by connecting through the internet and streets to ignite their passion for sneaker culture after the initial collaboration with nike dunk Spoon spring 2007 oh, yeah, i remember those. those those were quite nice i like them the basement returns by expanding the deep and deepening its communal ties through the special manchester inspired colorway and i love the fact that the mx90 because the mx90 is intrinsically a uk shoe intrinsically it's just a so the uk when i think about the uk and one air max that were kind of st um, kind of personify us it's the air max 90 when i was in school back in the day i remember having this great air max 90 that i got from my friend kind of second hand that was completely black and had like tumbled leather black with like an amazing silver swoosh like fucking beautiful and this was back in the day when they had the, the fat bubble and the bubble kind of started to yellow a bit started to stain so then when the ids came back around for the first time with the air max 90s the first thing that i did on id guess what was designed that black um and and silver air max 90 and the second design that i made i remember was this air max 90 Do you remember the women's air max 90 the, the white and pink one it was fucking gorgeous let me see if i can find it nike air max 90 women's and those are the only ones that i could those are the ones only ones i could buy no, the, I couldn't get a lot of shoes in the women's sizes because my feet are fucking huge. But I remember buying basically a, nine, a 12 and a half in women's and, that was, and those were the those were the ones that I could wear because I think they were like a, UK, a men's UK nine and a half. But they were such a delicious colorway. I'm not sure if I can find them on here, but they were beautiful. They had like white, blue and pink on them. Um, OG ones. Let's see if I can find them. Someone, Maybe someone's got them on here. Hopefully I have them. Let me see if I can find them. It's on the hip and screen. It's like an OG. Yeah, there we go. That's the colorway that I designed. This one's... Oh so beautiful so it's like a you got like white gray purple pink 
they look absolutely gorgeous. Like those were amazing. Those were some of my favorite Air Max 90s. And of course the, the all black pairs and that malarkey. But I think what they've done so far with the Air Max 90 collaboration, the basement has been fucking beautiful. I'm not really a fan of the Manchester ones. I think personally, my favorite has been the London pair, which I think I might have a picture of here. Yep, there we go. This is a picture from Versus that they posted. It looks fucking gorgeous. So, 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 so good. They really did a good job um, with these. Um, let me see if I can find another one. Yeah, that's the one, isn't it, right? That's the one, yeah, that's the one. So, yeah, the London pair is on here too. There's a, that's a London pair. They come with a removable swoosh that you can change the colors of the swoosh. They come in a little pack, similar to these Air Force ones that came out a while back. But they look fucking gorgeous. That is an amazing color of a shoe. I'm signed up, I think, for the Foot Patrol raffle at the moment. So hopefully I get those. That would be amazing. But I really like the I really like the pair. And I think the other one's Glasgow. The Glasgow one's probably just Benches and Glasgow are my favorite pair. You know, grey and muggy. Maybe the uh, is that to do a tizer, the orange tongue, maybe is it tizer? What's that side drink everyone drinks in Scotland? Tizer is a tizer? I think it's Tizer, right? Scotland drink. Tizer. Is it Tizer? Tizer, Scotland drink. Uh, Scotland. The Tizer? Tizer? What's that drink everyone drinks in Scotland? Maybe it's to do with Tizer. I don't know. Maybe it's to do with Tizer. Maybe not. I have no idea. Maybe it's to do with Tizer. Tizer. What's the drink they drink? Iron Brew. Sorry. Iron Brew. Yeah, I think it might be Iron Brew. Maybe, maybe that's what the skyline is all grey. And then um, Iron Brew, Iron Brew, Iron Blue. But yeah, um, maybe that's to do with the tongue. Uh, the tongue is Iron Brew orange and then everything else is grey on them. I'm not too sure, but the London ones are my favourite so far. Um, I probably won't even stick a swoosh colour on them. I'll just leave them as they are. They look fucking gorgeous. And you know what? They remind me of a little bit. They remind me a little bit of the DT Rascal Max 90s. You remember those? I had a pair of those and, and resold them. Unfortunately, I should have probably kept, kept them. Um, I regret selling those shoes, man. Probably one of my favourite shoes that I had. Like fucking gorgeous. They still go for fucking big bucks now at the moment. They're so, so, so good. So these are these Rascal Max 90s I had at the time. But yeah, so they remind me a little bit of these trainers. They were fucking gorgeous. Those were, that was a good old days of 1948, innit? Like, R.I.P. R.I.P. for real. But yeah, um, I'm looking forward to these coming out. Can't wait to get a pair myself. Um, Basement. And when are they coming out? I think this week, isn't it, right? Um, Let's see here. They've got, should have a release date on them so far. But I think they're coming out sometime this week. I'm pretty sure. Maybe it's a Thursday as per usual. Maybe Thursday. Let's see. The, the, the who we be what's that oh so it's a new corner. I don't know let's see let's wait to see this load up a little bit Bobbity, bobbity, boo! what do we have here yeah so they're coming out um there's a raffle open at the moment I've got them loaded up here on the drop date website encoding overload okay I'm gonna stop soon don't worry 19th of October so uh this Thursday right or that this, like this Friday uh, this Saturday actually so yeah look out for them sign up um, to get your pair they're available now on raffle from end for patrol five points SNS and of course um, sneakers app on Nike which you know I never have any luck with I'm sure you guys don't have any luck with either but yeah um, basement um, London or basement um, Air Max is in all the colors I think all the colors are coming out on the same day or maybe are they going to stagger the releases um, either way I like them real big fan of them I really like that packer consume Air Max ZX as well the bottom here that's really nice but yeah um, those those are my favorite of, of the whole collection so far and I can't wait to see if I get a pair probably not because I always catch L's but you know you can only hope you can only hope my friends Anyway, that's an hour so far. Thank you so much for tuning in. Go ahead up to work. As per usual, find all the links regarding myself in the show notes, axinozinga.com. You can find the link to my website, DJ Mixes, um, DJ Gigs, um, my blog links, my social media links, all on there. If you have a question regarding anything I've spoken about, leave me a comment in the YouTube page. If you have any question via the podcast app, be listening there, email me, let me know what you think. You can follow my socials all on there as well. Subscribe if it's your first time, like if it's your first time, leave me a five-star review, all that good stuff. And I'll see you guys again very, very, very soon. When I of the show probably tomorrow isn't it? as per usual but yeah tomorrow take care bye 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 peace